Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today as you can see we've got uh, part 90 I'm still stoked we've made it to part 90 of our Planet Zoo mod spotlights so We take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and then talk about the wonderful biodiversity that we have in our world today So really, really excited to um, talk about all of these cool animals I saved up some really interesting animals I think for the... Um, part 90 so it's kind of a bit more special than your typical just one full of fish mods <laughs> but um obviously still got a few fish mods here but i'm really excited to get stuck into this one because we've got some really really cool animals so today we're starting off with the um tench by leaf buff Sue, and ported from fishing planet we've got this little tench here uh really really awesome guy here as you can see so the tench also known as the doctor fish these guys are a fresh to brackish water fish uh, that are found throughout Eurasia from Western Europe and to the British Isles and into Asia um, into the Ob and Yesensi rivers and they're also found in Lake Baikal and they normally live in slow moving freshwater habitats like lakes and lowland rivers so in terms of their ecology the uh, tench is most likely found in still waters with clay or muddy substrate or abundant vegetation or and abundant vegetation and they're um, rare in waters with that are clear and have a stony substrate and are absent altogether from fast flowing streams but they are able to tolerate low oxygen concentrations and have been found in waters that even carp can't, can't survive so these guys mostly uh, feed at night with a preference of animals such as um, chronomids at the bottom of the eutrophic waters and they'll also eat snails and like pea clams and well vegetated water as well in terms of breeding these guys will breed in shallow water using the aquatic plants um, where the sticky green eggs can be deposited uh, spawning usually occurs in the summer for these guys and can have make as many as 30 300,000 eggs um, in one go the growth is rapid and they actually reach within their first year they get up a weight of 0.11 kilograms or 0.25 pounds in their first year of life so they are quite fast growing so you can see here by their morphology they're very carp like i believe they're a kind of a relative to carps and they're darker uh, above and almost golden below as you can kind of see here really interesting color to them and they've got these rounded um shape to their fins here uh they've got a narrow mouth and they've uh, don't really have a barbule they have a very small one as you can kind of see here but other than that they generally kind of not look like a but I don't have barbules the maximum size for these guys is about 70 centimeters but they got an average much smaller with a record of a fish getting between 15 uh, pounds 3 ounces or 3.89 kilograms that's kind of the record and the eyes are small and they have this red orange color to them and the sexual dimorphism is absent or weak which uh, limited by the female having a more convince, uh, convex ventral profile when compared to the males which is a very subtle difference um, and they also have these really small scales as you can kind of see here that are deeply embedded in a thick skin and that makes them slippery kind of like an eel and folklore actually tells it that the slime cured any sick fish that rubbed against it and that's where they got the name the doctor fish because they think that the the slime would have cured the sick fish which is pretty interesting so these guys um, are edible and work well with recipes that would otherwise call for carps but really eaten these days these are shoaling fish and are popular quarries for anglers and rivers lakes and canals and the tench particularly the golden tench which is an ornamental fish uh, these guys are kept as ornamental fish in ponds where they are bottom feeders and help keep waterways clean and healthy and in terms of angling these guys can maybe found in gravel pits and deep slow moving rivers with a <coughs> platony or silty bottom with copious aquatic vegetations and the best method of bait to catch these guys is float fishing or ledgering where the swim feeder uses maggots sweet corn pellets bread and worms and fish over a, a kilogram or two pounds in weight are very strong fighters when they're caught on the rod so very very interesting fish i really like the tench so uh again these little guys here are made by leaf buff Sioux, and porter for fishing planet like the next few species of fish that we'll be talking about so next we have got the sharp snouted lenoc which is a very interesting fish let's see if we can find them in here here they are so the striped um snouted lenoc uh the scientific name is brachymamaxis um which means short mustache which is pretty interesting um these guys are freshwater and bethnopelagic, so that means they're like deep open water, and they're androgynous and they migrate. Uh, they like temperate water, and they can be found from Siberia, Korea, and North China, so they live in the uh, Asia. 
In terms of their maximum size, these guys get about 70 centimeters uh, from total length uh, for a male or an unsexed, and then 60 centimeters for a female, so males are slightly larger. Uh, and the maximum publish, uh, published weight for these guys is about 8 kilograms. So quite a big fish, um, a good eating. So these guys are quite a slow growing fish that inhabit these uh, rivers. They're a cold water fish and never goes into the ocean since they find deep, deep cold waters during the summer and they can be found under the ice in late fall and winter. They feed typically on larval or adult insects, uh, amphipods, small fish, frogs, mice and other small mammals and things like that and also salmon spawn. And during spawning their body turns a dark red and the dorsal and pectoral fins become quite a bright colour as you can kind of see here I think. And um... These guys, as I mentioned, found like the lake drainage area of the, like, the more river basin, places like that. They are considered least concern, and they are um, commercial fished commercially. And uh, just a really, really awesome little fish here. I think they're really, really cool. They're a type of salmonoid, so they are related to other salmons, like uh, one animal coming up. We've got the chinhook salmon, all the other types of salmon, things like that. And that general family, as you can kind of see. And they get their name, the sharp uh, snouted Lenoch is by, and Lenoch is because of their very sharp snout, as you can kind of see here. It's very, very sharp compared to a lot of other salmon. So, yeah, that's uh, next one done by um, Leaf Buff Sioux Fishing Planet. Next one's also done by Leaf Buff Sioux Fishing Planet. We've got a really cool species here. We've got the Nile Tilapia. So, a really, really awesome guy here. So, let's see if we can find one swimming around in the water that's uh, going out for. Yeah, there we are. Here we are. So the Nile tilapia, these guys are a type of tilapia, which are a cichlid that are from the northern half of Africa and can be found in Israel and Lebanon. But there are numerous introduced populations around the world. And they're known commercially as the uh, mango fish. And uh, these fish can actually get quite big. These guys can get about 60 centimeters or 24 inches in length. And they can exceed 5 kilograms or 11 pounds with typical males being larger and growing faster than the females. So the wild natural type is kind of what you see here, is the uh, brown to grayish overall, uh, with and, uh, kind of the soft banding on the body, with these very vertically striped tails. And they're often confused with the blue tilapia, but they do look a little bit different, and they are known to hybridize in captivity with other types of um, cichlids so it's very hard to kind of find a pure one in captivity but this is kind of what your wild type looks like and they're actually quite long lived they could live up to uh 10 years or more than 10 years actually so these guys are native to larger parts of africa and they've been found like west africa lake chad the nile uh lake albert lake tana lake turkana the oma rivers are also found in israel and native to these coastal river basins but they've also been widely introduced because they are a game fish and uh, found in aquaculture they can be found in asia europe north and south america and this is where they're considered highly invasive and they actually impact species like the axolotl that i've mentioned a while ago and are a top predator and really affects these guys and they're considered highly invasive in these areas though some um populations may actually be hybrids of like Niles, uh, Nile and blue tilapias, for example. But um, that's just an example. So these guys, in terms of their habitat, these guys can be found mainly in freshwater habitats, such as rivers, streams, canals, lakes and ponds, and they range in sea level to an altitude of about 1,830 meters or about 6,000 feet. They can also occur in brackish waters, but are unable to survive very long in uh, salty water. They're typically reported to be living in... Um, water temperatures between 8 to 42 degrees celsius or 46 to 108 degrees fahrenheit but uh, typically above 13 and usually the lethal limit is like 39 to 40 degrees celsius but there are some variations within the population since some can survive cooler temperatures when they live in cooler temperatures and they generally breed around 24 degrees celsius or about 75 degrees fahrenheit so in terms of feeding, these guys are mostly herbivores, but they have omnivorous tendencies. So they can feed mostly on phytoplankton and algae, and in some populations are the macrophytes. But in other popular, uh, the recorded food items for these guys are detritus and larvae of like mosquitoes and other insect uh, larvae. And they have actually been considered a tool to fight malaria in Africa. But however, when introduced in their range, they can become um, invasive and threaten most local species. They typically feed during the daytime, which suggests that these guys, similar to trout and salmon, they are able to respond uh, to light as a major factor that contributes to their breeding ability. And due to their fast reproductive rate, um, 
Hopper population happens quite fast in Nihilotilapia. And to obtain nutrients, night feeding might also be due to competition for food during the daylight. And a recent study shows that sexual dimorphism between the sexes is uh, results from different food and conversion efficiency rather than different amounts of food. And although male and females can eat equal amount of foods, males will tend to grow larger because they have a higher efficiency at converting food into body weight. In terms of their social organization, these guys will establish social hierarchies in the group, with the dominant male having the priority for both food and mating. Circular nests are built predominantly by males through mouth digging and become future spawning sites. And these sites often become, uh, become sites of intense courtship rituals and parental care. And like other fish, they almost travel exclusively in schools. Um, some t tilapias, uh, the male is established, dominance between males is established through like non-contact displays, such as lateral display and tail beats. And they try to do this obviously to avoid fighting each other, but they do um, fight each other sometimes. Once the social hierarchy is established though, the dominant male gets the benefits of increased access to food and mates. However, social interactions between males and the presence of females result in my much higher energy expenditures and as a courtship displays and sexual um, competition things like that so in terms of reproduction uh, they reproduce through mass spawning with a brood within a nest made by that male and in such an arrangement the males uh, lead to large variations in their care and often inbreeding can be an issue um, female nile til tilapia in the presence of other females either visually or chemically can exhibit shortened interspanning uh, intervals and all the parental investment uh, of the female extends the interspawning period female tilapia will abandon the young to care from a male to care for a male gain this advantage of this interspawn inter um, spawning period which is pretty cool and that's really really cool in terms of parental care they take care of their babies by mouth breeding mouth brooding so the eggs will incubate in their mouths and similar to other species these guys are maternal mouth brooders uh, so the female will take um, care of the babies and is almost exclusively taken care of by the female. And after spawning in the nest made by the male, the young fry are carried in the mouth of the mother for a period of about 12 days. And sometimes the mother will push the young back into her mouth if she believes they're not ready to go outside. And the Nautilapia also demonstrate parental care in times of danger. And when approached by danger, the young will often swim back into the protection of their mother's mouth. And however, most mouth breeding leads to uh, significant metabolic modifications for their parents usually the mother as they are reflected by the fluctuations of body weight and low fitness and since female uh, nile tilapia can show extended into spawning periods they seem to uh, one of the benefits of slowing down um velanogenesis or yolk deposition it increases the survival of the one's young and the size of the spawn eggs correlate directly with the advantages the young have including like survival to begin with and the, that's one reason behind a delayed interspawning period is that they may benefit from that offspring survival, which is pretty cool. In terms of aquaculture, they've been a well-known uh, food uh, for even ancient Egyptians. And the wild type was very often like kept. Uh, they weren't really farmed very often because of the dark color um, in the modern times, but they were eaten in, in Egypt. And hybrid stocks have been made to try to create something that looks really nice and that does well as food. Uh, and does well in captivity as well and they are like hybrids and people cook them and things like that and luckily they are considered the least concerned so no issues with their populations there but really really awesome little blue to, uh, Nile tilapia um so these guys uh done by leaf buff zoo fishing planet as well so next we're going to be moving on to another really cool fish we have got the chinook salmon so a really awesome guy here let's see if we can find one swimming there's got to be some swimming there we are so the chinook salmon is the largest and most valuable species of um, Pacific salmon in North America. And the name is derived from the Chinookian peoples. But other names they have is King Salmon, Black Mouth, uh, Spring Salmon, Chrome Hog, things like that. So these guys are androgynous fish that are found in the North Pacific Ocean and in river systems in North America and the West, so from California to Alaska. And they can be found in Asian rivers such as from northern Japan and in the Arctic and North, uh, eastern Siberia. They've also been introduced for farming in lots of parts of the world, including New Zealand, uh, Michigan, and uh, rivers in Patagonia. And a large tunic salmon is actually quite prized and sought after. And um, their meat is actually very uh, nutritious and it has a high level of omega-3 fatty acids as well. Though some populations are endangered, most of them are healthy and they have not been assessed by the IUCN Red List. So they're kind of considered least concern at the moment. So their natural distribution, as I mentioned, is from kind of North America 
uh, that area and the rivers down there from Alaska to California. And then you have populations in Siberia and northern Japan. But the introduced populations I mentioned can be found like Michigan, Patagonia, New Zealand. And these guys are quite big. These guys, as you can see, blue greenish color to them. And um, on the top of the head, and then they've got the pink salmon there. The Chinook are uni uh, unique, actually, among the Pacific salmon, as they combine black and silver spots on their tail. Another distinctive feature is a black plumb line that is present in both salt and fresh water. Adult fish typically range from 24 to 36 inches, or 61 to 91 centimeters, but they may up be up to 58 inches, or 150 centimeters in length. They average about 10 to 50 pounds, or 4.5 to 22.7 kilograms, but can get to 130 pounds, or 59 kilograms. And the meat can be either pink and white in color, depending what the um, salmon's been feeding on. And the largest of the Pacific salmon, and they can get quite big, the record is 97 kilograms for angling them. And in terms of life cycle, they typically spend one to eight years in the ocean, or about average like three to four years, before they return to their home rivers to uh, spawn, and they undergo, undergo massive uh, morphological changes to prepare for spawning. So these guys are kind of in their freshwater phase in here, but the ocean phase looks very, very different. Um, so the thing is they develop canine teeth, and their jaws become a, get a pronounced hook, as you can kind of see here. Uh, when they're going into the rivers and studies actually show that larger and more dominant females uh, males i mean have a rep reproductive advantage over the female chinook and are often aggressive towards smaller males so they tend to spawn in larger and deeper waters than other salmon and can be found in spawning uh reds or nests in between september and december and the fish may lay her eggs on four or five nest pockets within a red and after laying the eggs the female will guard for them for about 24 to 25 days before dying while males will seek additional mates chinook eggs uh, hatch about 90 to 150 days after being deposited uh, depending on the water temperature and the eggs deposit are time to ensure that young salmon fry uh, emerge during the appropriate season to uh, for survival and growth and the fry and par which are kind of words for the young fish they typically stay in fresh water for about 12 to uh, 18 months before traveling down to estuaries where they remain as smolts for several months and then they some well, chinooks will actually return to fresh water for one or two years earlier than their counterparts and they're referred to as jack salmon and they're typically less than 60 centimeters or 24 inches long as when they're sexually mature so the longest migration of any salmon is actually these guys in the yukon river which is a migration of over 3,000 square kilometers or 1,900 square miles so they move from the bering sea up to the yukon uh, which is really really cool in terms of their diet these guys will eat insects amphipods and crustaceans when young and primarily other fish when they're older and young uh, salmon will feed on uh, stream beds for a short period until they're strong enough to journey out the ocean and eat more they're typically um, divided into two types the ocean type and the stream type the ocean type will migrate to salt water within the first year the stream type will spend one full year in fresh water before they migrate and a few years in the ocean adult salmon they'll be large enough to escape most predators and return to the original stream beds to bait uh, to mate and the chinook have extended lifespans while some fish can spend uh, live for one to five years these guys can reach up to eight years and more northerly populations on average tend to have longer lives so as I mentioned, they really need those healthy habitats. They rely on eelgrass and seaweeds for camouflage and protection from predators, things like that. Very important habitat for like that. And they need clean oxygenated water to live in and um, need to have a good level of algae to um, basically not to choke the rivers. So eutrophication is a big issue. But yeah, really, really awesome. In terms of fishing, uh, the t North Pacific harvest for... Um, Salmon 2010 was 1.4 million fish, which is about 7,000 tons, so a lot of fish, uh, quite a bit commercially, but wild uh, caught has really gone down and um, farmed is really going up. The world's actually f lead f producer and market supplier of Chinook salmon is New Zealand, and their market is King Salmon, and they export about 5,088 tons of salmon every year, or about in 2009, so that made 61 million New Zealand dollars. And so that's kind of why they were introduced and farmed, and they're also managed. Uh, so nine populations of Chinook salmon are, are listed under the United um, 
endangered species act in the United States, which, which are considered either threatened or endangered. Like the Snake River Fall Run populations are considered uh, is being considered delisted, but overall they're doing quite well. They are considered least concerned and are quite a common fish species, and luckily are being uh, farmed. So if anything happened, you could use them to reintroduce. But yeah, really, really, really awesome guys. I really do love these fish. Um, very important fish for um, the first like fishermen, like the uh, Native Americans, and then the colonizers or the uh, English or Europeans. You could say is probably the better word before they came and obviously fed on this fish and uh, helped probably pave the way to make America how it was, how it is today. So that's really, really awesome. A very cool fish steeped in history and just really interesting in terms of its biology and anatomy. So these four fish all come from Leaf Buff Zoo and all ported from Fishing Planet. So all of these guys here. So next we're going to move on to some awesome uh, land animals. We've got a couple birds first and then we've got a mammal and another bird. We're going to be starting off with the Southern Ground Hornbill. So this is done by uh, Narwhala. Uh, Narwhala definitely returning for some really awesome mods. So this is the southern ground hornbill. So these one of the two species of ground hornbill that are found in Africa and the largest species of hornbill in the world. They can be found in southern regions of Africa, ranging from Kenya to South Africa. And within these regions, they ha inhabit woodlands and savannas. And these guys are typically carnivores. These guys will mostly hunt on the ground and they find the majority of their food on the ground as well. Their food ranges from small animals, and insects, pretty much anything they get their mouths around. And um, yeah. These guys are quite a large bird. They can get about 90 to 100, 129 centimeters or 2 foot 11 to 4 foot 3 inches long. And females weigh between 2.2 to 4.6 kilograms and 4.9 to 10 pounds. While larger males can get 3.5 to 6.2 kilograms or 7 to 13 pounds. The average weight for a female is about 3 kilos and uh, average weight for males is about 4 kilos. With a wingspan of about 1.2 to 1.8 meters. So... Uh, it's three foot eleven to five foot eleven, and among these standard measurements, these guys are just quite uh, makes them quite a bit bigger than uh, a lot of other species. And the way you can kind of tell these apart from other species is that they're characterized by this classic black, uh, black coloration, and they have these vivid red patches on their face, like the throat and little waters and things. But it's yellow and juvenile birds, as we'll kind of have a look there. Um, these are and these long eyelashes, as you can see here, that are generally actually believed to keep. Um, uh, dust out of their eyes uh, when they're foraging. So as I mentioned, these guys can be found in Southern Africa. So they can be found in Namibia, Angola, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Burundi, and Kenya. And uh, they like savanna habitats with large trees for nesting and dense and sh but short grass to foraging. They're quite a vulnerable species actually, and they are mainly confined to national reserves and uh, parks and stuff like that. They typically live in groups of about five to 10 individuals. That includes adults and juveniles. And often na uh, neighboring groups uh, engage in aerial pursuits as they are apex predators and quite actually important. Uh, they forage on the ground where they feed on reptiles, frogs, uh, snails, insects, mammals up to the size of hares, so they're quite uh, predatory, and they actually very rarely drink, and their range is limited to the western end by the lack of trees which they need to build nests. So these guys are also very vocal, they make um, calls that can get uh, by chorus and they can be heard up to three kilometers away, and these calls allow each group to maintain their territories, which actually needs to be as large sometimes as 100 square kilometers or 40 square miles, even in really good habitat. So another weird thing about these guys is that they take part in cooperative breeding. So they're obligate cooperative breeder with each breeding pair is associated with at least two other birds. And they're known, to, and this is known through captivity. And these birds without six years experience as helpers as a nest uh, are unable to breed successfully. And if they do, if they do become breeders. And this suggests that unpaired pairs cannot rear young and that they use helpful skills as a juvenile as essential for rearing um, young as adult. So basically they raise the babies that they have communally. Uh, so they can learn from the, obviously the dominant pair and how to raise babies until they can make their own babies if they get a chance. They have quite a long lifespan as well. In captivity, they've been reported to live up to 70 years. And it's generally believed that their life expectancy is a bird that survives long enough to fledge as high as 30 years or more in the wild. And actually makes them comparable to birds like Kakapo and the wandering albatross as being some of the longest lived birds in the world. In terms of um, breeding and their maturity, let's have a look at these little guys here. So after about 40 to 40, oh, that's not the right one. So that's the female. 
males, as you can see, they're quite a bit brighter than the red here. Well, that's the female. This is the male. So the males, you can see, they're... Oh, I'm trying to get a good... That's a bit... So the males are kind of all red, and the females have a hint of blue, as you can see here, which is really, really awesome. But anyway, we're going to talk about the little baby here, who, as you can see, has got the yellow um, around his face. So in terms of uh, breeding, after about a 4 to 45 um, day incubation, uh, they typically uh, kind of hatch, and then after 85 day fledging period, the young will remain dependent on their parents and their helpers for between one to two years after, uh, depending on climate conditions, which is longer than any other bird. And these guys can only normally breed successfully every third year. And triennial breeding is extremely rare in birds. And the only other example is the ornate hawk eagle in the neotropical uh, rainforests. So in terms of reaching maturity, they reach maturity at about six to seven years old, but only very few breed at this age. And nests are almost um, always in deep hollows and very old trees. Though they have existed reports of ground hornbills uh, resting in uh, nesting in rock faces as well. One to three eggs are typically laid in the wet season, but um, simpler side ensures that only one nestling is ever fledged. And the eggs typically reach 73 millimeters or 2.87 inches and 56 millimeters or 2.2 inches wide. And they are pure white but very rough in texture. So these guys, in terms of their conservation, they are considered vulnerable for a few reasons. Uh, because of um, they have been classified that in a lot of their areas of range because of um, prosecution for hunting as well. And it's because of a very complex issue. They're often considered like a um, pest or sometimes a, a lot of cultural issues as well because they're believed to be like a harbinger of death, which is a very sad thing to put on these birds. So it's a lot of cultural beliefs, also um, lots of hunting. Uh, and plus these guys are such slow breeders, it's very hard for them to recover. Um, they're also being prosecuted for destroying windows. Uh, they're very slow breeders. Habitat change, deforestation, electric electrocution on power lines, um, accidental poisoning, and these are all kind of major factors that affect the population. And as I mentioned, they're kind of associated with either death in several cultures. So if you see one, it's often um, unluckiness or death. And sometimes they're also associated with like rains, droughts, lightnings, or weather forecasts, which is pretty interesting. And, but luckily, there's lots of people trying to educate, and obviously, they're considered endangered species, luckily, or vulnerable, so there are protections in place. So as long as um, people don't hunt them too much, and we can allow their populations to recover. They're only vulnerable at the moment, hopefully. I, I could be an argument for endangered, but they have such a wide range, and they live uh, pretty much a fine in national parks, so pretty, pretty awesome species. Again, done by Norwala, who did a wonderful job with these guys. So next, moving on to another bird. This one is done by Bongo Hardwood. How can you not love Bongo Hardwood? I love his birds. I really, really, really like uh, talking about birds, as you could kind of tell. <laughs> so um, the Desmosilli crane, as you can see here, there are species of crane that is found in central Euro-Siberia. So they're found from the Black Sea into Mongolia and northeastern China with a small breeding population in Turkey. Um, these are migratory birds. And birds from Western Eurasia will spend the winter in Africa, and while the birds in Asia, Mongolia, and China will spend their winters in India. And this bird is quite significant for the culture in India, where they're known as the Kunji or the Kun Kujar, I believe you say that. These are not the biggest, uh, they're kind of the smaller species of crane. They typically get about 85 to 100 centimeters, or um, 33 to 39 inches long, about 76 or 30 inches uh, tall, or 76 centimeters tall. And they have a wingspan of 155 to 180 centimeters or 61 to 71 inches uh, wide and they weigh up to two to three kilos or about four to six pounds and they're slightly smaller than the common crane but they have a slightly uh, and a quite similar plumage but they also have this long white neck stripe as you can kind of see here uh, and they have uh, black on the fore neck as you can kind of see here and then they have this really nice uh, plume here that looks like a really nice crest uh, which is really really cool they also have quite a loud trumpeting call that's higher pitched than um co the common crane and they have dancing displays that are more um ballerina than other while well, these guys uh, don't really leap as much so in terms of the habitat these guys uh live in a variety of different environments from deserts to grasslands and often can be found within a few hundred meters of a stream or lake however they uh, when nesting they prefer patchy areas of vegetation 
which is tall enough to conceal their nests and things like that. They also take part in one of the toughest migrations in the world. So in late August through September, they gather in flocks of up to about 400 or so individuals. Uh, and then they prepare for their flight in the winter range. And due to them, uh, during their migration south, like all cranes, they have their heads and necks straight forward and their legs straight behind them. And they reach altitudes of about 16,000 to 26,000 feet or 4,900 to 7,900 meters, which is quite tall. And they actually have to cross the Himalayan mountains in a lot of areas to um, get to their overwintering areas in India, with lots of them dying from fatigue, hunger, and predation by golden eagles. And simpler, longer routes are possible sometimes, but it just they sometimes just want to go over the, uh, the Himalayas because it's quicker, which is quite funny. <laughs> and um, in the winter grounds, these guys have been found in flocks with um, common cranes, and the combined, uh, combined flocks can get up to about 20,000 individuals. And these also maintain separate, separate social groups within these flocks. And in March, April, they begin their long spring journey back up to their northern uh, nesting grounds. So in culture, um, these guys are kind of known as the Kunji and languages in northern India, and they're found a lot in um, uh, uh, literature, literature, poetry, things like that. And beautiful women are often compared to these guys because they have quite a gracile form, things like that. And just a really, really awesome bird. And they are considered least concerned, luckily. They are quite common, but they're just so pretty. It's like, why not show them off? And they have uh, very, very cute babies. And look at look at this little guy. How can you not love this little guy? So that's where they nest up in north. So they typically nor uh, breed in like Euro Siberia, things like that. That's where they normally uh, live uh, and breed there. A lot of species tend to breed up north like that. Really, really awesome. I just love these guys here. Really, really beautiful birds. So next, we've got Nawala back again and doing the next three animals. Oh, we've got a remake of his. This is the Pierre David's deer, a really, really cool animal that I love. So here is the wonderful Pierre David's deer. So these guys, um, Ulafus uh, Davinus, or um, also known as the Merlu, these guys are a species of deer that are native to uh, the river valleys of China, where they grazed mainly on grass and aquatic plants, and they are considered extinct in the wild, as I get into. So... They were hunted almost to extinction in their native China by the late 19th century, but a number were taken in by zoos uh, in France and Germany, and they successfully bred in captivity. And in the earliest 20th century, a British nobleman and a um, politician, Herbrand Russell, who was the 11th Duke of Bedford, acquired a few of these deer from the Berlin Zoo and built up a large herd as an estate. And in the 1980s, the grandson of this guy donated several uh, these deer to the Chinese government to... Uh, reintroduce species into the wild and as of 2020 the wild population is estimated to be about 2825 individuals with a further 7380 in various nature reserves in china and all periods the alive today are descended from the um, duke's original herd so as i mentioned they've kind of got their cool name the, they've sometimes known as the Simbuzang in um, Chinese or uh, Japanese, which means four not alike, which are very, very interesting looking animals. And they also get the name the Merlu. So in terms of the cat characteristics, they get a head to body length of about 1.9 to 2.2 meters or 6.2 to 7.2 feet long. And they stand about 1.2 meters or three foot nine uh, at the sh shoulder. They also have a relatively long tail for a deer that gets up to like 60 centimeters or 26 inches. Uh, when um, straightened and their weight is typically between 135 to 200 kilograms or 300 uh, to 440 pounds which is a little bit smaller than a red deer and they have these quite long slender heads with these large ears uh, a large eyes i mean they also have a large pre-orbital gland with a naked nose pad and a small pointed ears as you can kind of see here very interesting look i think they just look like a dr seuss animal so um let's have a look at this guy over here while we're talking about them so as you can see, these uh, branch antlers are actually quite unique, as you can kind of see here. It really reminds me of Dr. Seuss. And the main bean uh, usually always goes upwards, which is really interesting. And these summer antlers are the largest set, and there's dropped in November, and then after the summer rut. And if a second set, if they do appear, are fully grown in January, and then they fall asleep afterwards. So you can see their coat is kind of this more reddish tan in the summer, as you can see here, and typically more dullish gray in the winter. They have these long guard heads that are present uh, throughout the year because it helps them to 
uh, and it becomes woollier in the winter to help them keep cool. They also have this little mane on their neck and this dark line going down their back and they have tufts on their ears as well. And they have large hooves that allow them to uh, walk in like uh, um, mangroves, well not mangroves, but uh, swamps and uh, marshes and things like that. And they make clicking sounds like uh, when they're moving their hooves like reindeer when they're moving. And they're semi-aquatic, so these guys can swim quite well and spend long periods of water up to their shoulders. And although they're predominantly grazers, these guys will feed, uh, supplement their diet with aquatic plants in the summer. In terms of behavior, these guys have similar reproductive uh, mechanisms uh, to other deer in temperate latitudes. Uh, these guys, uh, um, stags different from highs, these guys will rut. So in the um, breeding season, the males will come and rut and then fight each other. Very similar to most other species of deer. And then the females will kind of pick the one that she likes the most. Uh, very similar to other species of deer. We'll have a look at the babies while we... Um, Look how cute these guys are. So typically the gestation period for these guys is about nine months or about uh, 280 days. After which uh, these guys uh, give birth to a single offspring or sometimes twins. And twins, are, as I mentioned, born really. The gestation period is actually significantly longer than most deers other than roe deer. And these guys are considered seasonal breeders because three out of the four calves are born, uh, three out of four calves are born in April in captive European populations. The breeding season is also 160 days, with the mating season usually beginning to June and July. And the calf weight is usually about 11 to uh, 13 kilograms. And these juveniles can, can be referred to either fawns or calves. Have this spotted coat here, as commonly seen in most species of deer, and then they lose that as they get older. They don't develop very quickly after birth, and they reach sexual maturity in about 14 months, and then the average lifespan for these guys is about 18 years. So, really, really cool guys. So these guys, um, in being in captivity so long, so long, like the population has been in captivity for about a thousand years, and that's kind of been an issue. Sometimes they need to be, um, they've since they've been isolated from the wild so long, and a lot of them forgot like how to be scared of tigers and things like that. So they kind of got to relearn that. And but historically, they were preyed upon by tigers and leopards, although they no longer face that since most of the population is in captivity. So in terms, as we're going to talk about these guys here, so their range uh, went across most of China, so they can be found in the Yangtze River Basin, things like that, and according, their population has exceeded at least 8,000 in China now, and they're under first class protection, uh, protection. and after this, like as I mentioned, the Duke of Belford kind of really, uh, gave, donated his deer to the government, they were reintroduced uh, into China in 1985 with a herd of about 20 deer or so. And then it has been um, kind of different uh, reintroductions ever since. Uh, there's been another one in 1986 and uh, lots of reintroduc uh, reintroductions, things like that. And they were considered in 1996 critically endangered as their wild population is less than 50 individuals. And they're still technically considered um, extinct in the wild until these re reintroduced populations are um, considered long term, long term, like viable which they aren't now, so they're being supplemented still and still kind of being monitored by um, uh, people. So that's why they're kind of not considered, even though there are populations living in the wild, they're still considered extinct in the wild because they're still getting monitored and need to be supplemented. Um, today there's about 53 herds of Pierre's deer and Pierre David's deer in China, with nine herds consisting of 25 or under deer and the remaining herds under 10 deer. And during the small population size is kind of a bottleneck, especially genetic bottleneck, but the captive population has increased and there's been talks about reintroducing populations in their future, which is really cool. And they do sometimes face problems when they're released because they spent years and years, like over a thousand years of captivity. Things like a relaxed selection for reproduction with no environmental, uh, environmental pressure. It takes place at the David's deer. So that means they've lost a lot of anti-predator behavior, as I mentioned before. And they need to kind of help adapting sometimes uh, and getting used to like dogs barking, things like that, to try and um, learn, to <laughs> basically teach them to be scared of tigers again. And um, yeah, there are populations in New Zealand that have been um, hybridized uh, just to in experiments, things like that, that there are. So there is a farm down in um, Mount Hutt Station in the South Island that has Pierre David's deer. And in terms of their cultural significance, these guys... Uh, have a Chinese legend where the tyrant king Zhao of Shang ruled the land for more than 3,000 years 
a horse, a donkey, an ox, and a deer went to a cave, and then they meditated, and the animal awoke from their meditation and entered society and became very powerful. Very, very interesting animal here. I just love it, Perry David's deer. They're really, really beautiful. Done by Norwalo. Wonderful remake. Just look at these antlers, man. Beautiful. So, next one's also done by Narwala, but we're doing some extinct species. I'm really excited to talk about this guy. So, we have got here um, the elephant bird, or um, a Abjornis, I believe you say that. Really, really awesome. Abjornis. So, this is your elephant bird. Uh, these are one of the three genus of elephant birds that are endemic to Madagascar, which are only found in Madagascar. This species is Abjornis uh, maximus. So this is kind of like the largest of the um, Adjornus genus. These guys reach a weight of about 540 kilograms or 1,200 pounds, and until recently were regarded as the largest bird of all time. However, there was a new genus. The largest specimens, with weighed up to 730 kilograms or 1,600 pounds, were moved to the genus Varombe in, 20, in 2018. Uh, so there's kind of those four. There's the genus... Uh, this, Mulionis, and then there's Varombe and Aebjornis, which is pretty awesome. And believe it or not, you think these guys would be more closely related to emus or something like that, but these guys are actually more closely related to your kiwi. So, uh, very interesting. So, the kiwi and the elephant birds split off during the Oligocene, and then they, since their ancestors were actually able to fly, um, they were able to fly around Gondwana, so they managed to land in Madagascar. And then the ancestors of the Kiwis were able to land New Zealand and split off from there. So that's really, really interesting. So that's how they know we're gene uh, genetically related to them. That's, that's really interesting. So uh, they're commonly known as the elephant bird. Um, and there is legends of the, the rock bird, uh, where they kind of also get the name. This is to be a giant raptor. There is a giant subfossil eagle, but the, the rock kind of typically gets refers to the large eggs laid by these guys or laid by these guys so in terms of their anatomy stuff like that these guys are giant flightless ratites from madagascar and they were became extinct about the 11th century or about a thousand ad they were one of the world's largest birds they got up to about three meters tall or about nearly 10 feet and weighed up to um in this species 330 to 540 kilograms or 730 to 1200 pounds and um adab um uh, Maximus. So adults uh, with has been adults and eggs have been found, and the eggs are the largest of any um, animal. So the eggs have been had a circumference of over a meter, and a length of about thirty four centimeters or thirteen inches. And um, the egg volume is believed to be one hundred and sixty times greater than that of a chicken egg. As we talk about these little guys here. There was also a study that actually looked at their skulls, and it's believed that these guys have poor eyesight and large olfactory bulbs, very similar to modern kiwi, and it suggested that these guys may be nocturnal like kiwi, but that kind of interpretation is time of flimsy, and it could be that these guys actually just um, lived in low-light conditions, such as in forests, things like that. In terms of uh, reproduction, occasionally these sub-fossil eggs uh, do, uh, can be found intact, and there's actually one found with an um, embryonic embryo, and this egg is on display, I believe, in the Harvard Museum of uh, Natural History in Cambridge. And another one was actually taken by Sir David uh, Attenborough, who has put it together and looks really cool. So in terms of their extinction, we know their ecology. They're kind of like big, look at these cute babies, by the way, big, um, like almost giraffe replacing like your large herbivores on Madagascar, since there weren't really that many large mammals other than the uh, lemurs. Um, there was also tortoises as well. They kind of took that niche as like those large grazing herbivores. It's widely um, accepted that these guys went extinct because of humans. The birds were initially widespread across Madagascar, and one theory states that they were hunted to extinction uh, by humans. And there's indeed evidence that they were killed by humans and humans ate their eggs. Though it's very possible climate change could have played a big role in um, their extinction as well. The exact time period they went extinct, we kind of don't know. Uh, but it's believed that there is folk memories of these guys and the latest archaeological evidence that these guys may have lived about a thousand um, became extinct pretty much like a thousand years ago or so and there's um, also hyper um, suggested that these guys could have um, 
got diseases from things like guinea fowl and chickens that could have spread from humans bringing them and these diseases affected um, the elephant birds and potentially contributed to their extinction which is another very interesting theory and um, another thing as well is just being so large and island species laying such big eggs and living so long and breeding so slow these kind of species are very vulnerable to extinction with one individual is actually a big hit to the population but yeah really really awesome regardless i really love the design of this as well i really love the like little whiskers it's like a kiwi really reminds me of that really really awesome and as you can kind of see here for those zoo tycoon 2 fans you can see this is kind of a variant with uh that looks like the one from that game which i think is really rather cool and look at these cute babies man how can you not love these adorable little babies really really wonderful now while i really did a wonderful job with these uh elephant boots and he's also going to do a wonderful job with the next animal here last but most certainly not least we have got the woolly rhinoceros really really awesome here so let's see if we can find the male i think he's most impressive big big beautiful rhino here so the woolly rhinoceros or celodonta antiquitus uh these guys are an extinct species of rhinoceros is commonly found throughout europe and asia during the last ice age and they are considered kind of your typical Pleistocene megafauna. So these guys are very similar in a lot of ways to your um, normal rhino. They were like your white rhino. So um, these guys lived out in those open grasslands. The habitat is typically termed the mammoth steppe. So it's like a vast, dry, cold um, uh, steppe or grassland where they lived and fed on plants and things like that. So... Um, in terms of their evolution, these guys are most derived member of their genus of Celodonta. Their closest extinct relative to the woolly rhinoceros is the Elasmotherium, which is another big Pleistocene rhino. They split from the during the first half of the Miocene, and then another genus, um, Stephyrhinus, which is uh, very similar, as may actually show that they're actually a sister group. And they actually found a rhino mummy from Stephyrhinus, which is pretty cool. The woolly rhinoceros may have descended from uh, a kind of Tibetan celodonta animal. Um, so they would have lived in the, um, the Himalayan plateau or the Tibetan plateau. And then kind of once the ice age hit, they managed to spread out into Eurasia and kind of really take advantage of the dry mammoth steps that were appearing. And there's a, actually a study on their DNA from like a 40 to 70,000 year old um, woolly rhino mummy there's a lot of those i'll get into they actually suggest that their closest living relative is not your typical white rhino though they look so similar they're actually more closely related to the sumatran rhinoceros which is possibly one of the rarest living rhinos with probably less than 80 individuals alive which is kind of sad and but really really awesome to learn about these relationships um in terms of their body size and appearance and things like that these guys typically get about three meters to 3.8 meters or 10 to 12 feet long from head to tail and they have an estimated weight from 1800 to 2700 um, kilograms or about 4600 pounds uh, 4000 to 6000 pounds or about 200 to 2000 kilo, uh, kilograms or about 4400 pounds they typically get six foot uh, two meters or six and a half feet at the shoulder and are typically about the same size and dimensions as your white rhinoceros uh, a one month old calf as you can kind of see here we've got some preserved uh, rhino uh, woolly rhino calves um, they typically at a month old are about 120 centimeters or about three feet 11 inches long at about 72 centimeters or two foot four inches at the shoulder Similar to other rhinos, they have this large horns of keratin, uh, which is the same material that makes your fingernail. And compared to other rhinoceros, they have quite a longer head and body, and shorter legs, which is potentially to help conserve body heat. They also have this large uh, hump here, which supported muscles to support their um, large horns, and also may potentially had some fat storing abilities, so they could help survive some of the harsher winters. A uh, bit of a fat reserve. Preserved fossil, uh, fossil specimens and like frozen specimens show that these guys had this long fur coat that was like a reddish brown with a thick undercoat with the, um, which was guarded by these large um, or long um, guard hairs that allowed them to keep those hairs dry. And they have the, these just long uh, bits of um, hair. They ended with about 45 to centimeter, 45 to 50 centimeter long tail with a brush uh, of coarse hair at the end as well. And uh, the woolly rhinoceros have several features such as um, smaller ears uh, to preserve heat and shorter tails. 
and they also have quite large as you can see um, horns there that were probably used for defense and uh, mating things like that so same reasons kind of your modern runners have them those horns could get to about one meter or about three foot three inches long or growing up to 1.4 meters or four foot seven inches and their weight was actually um, 15 kilograms or so um, and they're far more forward facing as you can see than typical modern rhinoceros so these guys also have a skull that's about 70 to 90 centimeters or 30 to 35 inches which is longer than those of any rhino and they have this deep downward facing slanting position which is very similar to elasmotherium and stephyrhinus uh, with these strong muscles along the um, inclusional bone that formed the neck hook that held that massive skull uh, there was also the nasal um, sternum of these guys was ossified like modern unlike modern rhinos and was typically more common in adult males uh, which is believed to be uh, adaption to help uh, push uh, its head and face through um, under the snow to get to the food under it and um, yeah, in terms of their paleobiology, they had quite a similar life history to your typical modern rhinoceros. Uh, they have the studies in the milk teeth show that these individuals actually developed quite similar to white and black rhinos. The females had two teats, which uh, you typically raised one or really two calves um, every two or three years. And if similar to modern rhinos, they lived with their mother about three years before they searched for their own territory and they reached sexual maturity at about five or so years old. We'll have a look at the cute little baby while we talk about the rest of it. Uh, woolly rhino is actually believed to live for about 40 years, very similar to its modern relatives. And due to this large horn and size, it would have been pretty much invulnerable to most predators. But young individuals could be taken by hyenas and cave lions. And a skull was actually found with trauma uh, from attack from a feline, but they actually managed to survive into adulthood. And obviously these large horns would be used for intra-Pacific combat, so fighting each other as well as moving snow um, under and getting to the vegetation under it during the winter. And they also were probably quite territorial. They um, uh, rushed during the rushing season. They would fight each other. There's fossil evidence that shows damage on the front horns from other rhinos and lower jaws and ribs. So sign of being broken or reformed, which may have been from fighting. And the apparent frequency of this combat compared to recent rhinos is likely a result of rapid climate change where these guys face stress from um, changing climates and not being able to find as much food in comparison to uh, better times. In terms of their diet, these guys mostly fed on grasses and sedges that grew on the mammoth steppe. And because of their downward facing um, head they were able to graze quite easily they had an upper lip that was quite similar to that of a white rhinoceros and they typically ate um, grasses and sedges and things like that but pollen analysis also shows that they do eat uh, conifers willows and alders and other woody plants along with forbs moss uh, flowers and mosses and isotopes show that these guys had a seasonal diet and different areas of horn, uh, horn growth suggest that they mainly graze during the summer and then they browse during the winter and pretty interesting is that they're comparing the skull, mandible, and teeth of a well-preserved um, late cold stage individual recovered from Staffordshire revealed the muscular and dental characteristics of that of a grazing feeding preference. And in particular, the enlarge enlargement of the temporalis and the neck muscles were consistent with that of large um, tugging forces, which they're able to take in large mouthfuls of fodder from the ground. And, comp and comparing them to uh, living perissodactyls or living rhinos, these guys were a hindgut fermenter with a single stomach, and they consumed cellulose-rich, uh, protein-poor fodder, and they often ate just a lot of it. And woolly rhinos living in the Arctic during the la last glacial maximum probably ate lots of forbs, things like that. So in terms of their habitat and distribution, as I mentioned, they lived mainly in lowland plat uh, plateau areas when river valleys and dry and attic climates and migrated to higher elevations as the, uh, the um, ice kind of uh, spread. So typically they would spread more when the um, glacials kind of got to their maximum and then uh, retreat back when the glaciers melted. So they avoided mountainous regions, but they typically lived on the mammoth steppe and lived with animals such as woolly mammoths, giant deers like megaloceros, uh, uh, red uh, reindeer, sega antelope and bison and lived in that kind of fauna complex and also lived with Steffi Rhinus and Lasmotherium. They um, did actually did not cross the Bering Land Bridge, surprisingly, because of the low grass density and lack of suitable habitat in Yukon. 
uh, they potentially just couldn't get past it. And even if they did get past it, they probably didn't leave any fossils behind just because they didn't manage to get around. And there's no evidence of rhinos in America, uh, woolly rhinos in America, so we don't really know. But yeah, these guys, at the end of the um, Rus Rusk glaciation about 130,000 years ago, they th lived throughout uh, northern Eurasia and spanned most of Europe, Siberia, Mongolian plateau. And fossils have actually been found as far north as the New Siberian Islands and actually has the widest range of any rhinoceros species, which is pretty cool. So uh, in terms of a relationship with people, people were hunting them. Uh, of course, there's been evidence of uh, marks on animal bones with injuries from failed hunts. And both horns have been used as, uh, and bones of rhinos have been used for weapons by people during that time. And there's lots of ancient art. There's like part art from the Upper Paleolithic that depicts the woolly rhinoceros. And that's part of the reason we kind of know what it looks like. And the art often depicts it, uh, depicts it with a, a big hump here and a low lying head with these curved lines representing its ears. And also this dark band going down the body, which may actually be part of their coloration, which is also kind of supported by the frozen specimens which is really cool. So in terms of their extinction, like most of the Pleistocene megafauna, they went extinct during the end of the Ice Age. Uh, human hunting is often the most common cause, but there's lots of other things such as climate change, the hyper disease hypothesis, potentially a combination of these factors. And it seems that these guys were quite specialized for the mammoth step, they like cooler weather, and they were cap but capable of surviving in warmer climates. And other cold dapper species managed to survive, of course, the um, climate change and that's why this supports the overkill hypothesis in the woolly rhino but it really could be lots of um factors that took uh, place to uh human hunting changes in climate uh, changes in habitats potentially caused their extinction or could have contributed and they went extinct sadly at about 10,000 bc at um in siberia which is pretty sad but there may be evidence they may have survived a little longer and potentially up to like uh 9,000 or something like that by eDNA. And there's lots of frozen specimens. There's been many found. Some are pretty complete. Some are just mummified heads and things like that. Um, there's also some baby rhinoceros that were preserved and is like one of those really cool discoveries. And in September 14, there was one discovered and it shows it's soft tissues, hair and head and horns. Some parts have been thawed and eaten, but not uh, covered by permafrost. So really we know a lot because of the DNA and these preferred specimens and know what we eat and some preserved injuries show that these guys had quite an interesting story and complex lives. So that's really, really awesome and woolly rhinos are just such a cool animal. Just how can you not love these guys? So um, yeah, Narwhala, you've really done a wonderful job depicting this animal and um, yeah. I think this would be a great place to end the episode. So congratulations and thank you to everyone who made these mods. You guys have really done a wonderful job this episode. And yay for part 90. We're only 10 more away from 100. So really excited to get stuck into that. So um, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified of anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe and bye-bye.